Good evening and welcome to Yakety Yak. I'm Anne Mees Day and I welcome you here tonight on behalf of Peter Shergold and all at the Centre for Social Impact, or CSI. It's a great pleasure tonight to be holding this event in Melbourne, which is the home of two of our founding universities, Swinburne University of Technology and the Melbourne Business School. The University of New South Wales is our third member. CSI aims to generate social innovation and deliver community benefit. One of the ways we do this is to bring together thinkers from the not-for-profit, corporate, government and philanthropic sectors to discuss issues and debate ideas. Yakety Yak fits very well into this aim. It's a series of interviews conducted by Peter Thompson to profile a guest whose views and experience are important and groundbreaking. In this spirit, we bring to you tonight, as our guest, Eve Marlab. Eve founded the Women Donors, which aims to assist women and girls. She's an early advocate for women and was a member of the Women's Electoral Lobby and the Women Lawyers Association from the start. She is a very impassioned advocate and has been awarded the Order of Australia for her work, particularly with women. Welcome Peter Thompson and Eve Marlab to commence their discussion. Thank you very much, Anne, and uh, good evening, Eve. Good evening, Peter. Good to uh, meet you after hearing of your name decades ago. It's good to meet you <laughs> at last. Um, so we're going to have a conversation for a while, as Anne says, and then uh, open it up for questions, and we'll continue that conversation over dinner. So I want to talk to Eve about uh, her life, uh, her interests and her work. And when I thought about those two words, her interests and her work, I thought, in a sense, her interests and her work so overlap. That's really been one of the great stories of your life, really, that uh, you've pursued your interests in your work, um, which uh, is part of the answer to the question, what's the good life, I think. Um, your family left it very late to leave Vienna. They left in 1939 when you were two. That's right. Why were things left so late? I think they just believed that, let's put it the other way, they couldn't believe what was happening. And uh, I think they were lucky to get out. Mm. Uh, was Australia an easy destination to uh, negotiate coming to? No, it was difficult to get visas. And we were very lucky in that... Um, one of my uncles had a business which was one of the first businesses to be taken over by the Nazis. And um, he was actually a bit paranoid, but if you're paranoid, it doesn't actually mean that they're not out to get you. And he decided that they were out to get him. And he looked at a map and what was the farthest away from Austria. And it was Melbourne, Australia. So he came here and he then and his wife got visas for the rest of the family to come to Australia. And we were very lucky because it wasn't easy to get visas. Well, as I mentioned, you were two, so I guess you have no memories of uh, Europe at that time. Um, what impact did all of these events have on you and your upbringing? It's hard to say, really. I, I don't think it had an immediate impact, but I think that if you hear of a history of um, discrimination, it does make you more interested in discrimination and more, uh, uh, more eager to fight it. And I think in a way I transferred uh, my feeling of powerlessness as a Jewish person to what was a feeling of powerlessness as a woman. Mm. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. Did your parents talk much about the war? Um, yes, but they always made jokes about it. It was too painful for them really to talk about it. And when my mother was in her 70s, she did a creative writing course and she had to write about a piece of clothing. And she wrote a, pair, uh, she wrote a, a story about a pair of underpants that she'd had written, that she'd had particularly sewn 
because the Nazis made the Jewish girls <coughs> um, scrub the pavements. And she, being a nice middle-class girl, didn't want anyone to look up her skirt. And so she had this pair of underpants sewn. And I asked her, I said to her, Mummy, you always made a joke of um, that time. And she said, yes. She said, didn't I wasn't cross. And as she spoke, she just started crying and the tears started streaming out her face. Mm. And she was seven, in her 70s at the time. Did they, they find discrimination in Australia when they came? No, <coughs> they didn't. I think they probably felt that they were patronised, but that didn't bother them at all. And um, they pa just Patronised how? In the sense that people uh, went out of their way, really, to um, look after them and be nice to them. And um, they didn't mind that at all. They just thought it was kindness. They loved Australia from the, the minute they got here. So what was your upbringing like? I was an only child and I think my parents, like a lot of migrant parents, wanted me to do well. And so um, there was a lot of thought about what I should study and um, there was a lot of pressure to do well. And I did well. <laughs> And were you a party to that? Were you, you know, did you play the role of the only child properly? I Made don't know what the, the proper role of an only well, child is. It's to be the perfect princess, really. Um, yes, yes, I was, yes, I was a princess. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> if you ask my husband, he'll say I'm still a princess. <laughs> uh, why did you choose law, or to to what extent was that? Um, were well, you pushed was, or pulled? There were two things. First of all, my father said that I was so outspoken and so difficult that I would never find a husband, or I wouldn't find a husband who would stay with me. That was basically, I have to tell you, I've been married for 50 years now. Um, so, so far that's that been was, wrong. That was the first thing. So I had to be able to earn my own living. And in that, he was far ahead of his time. That was not a time when girls were you know, encouraged to earn their own living. And secondly, he said that because I was so outspoken, law was the right course for me. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I trusted him, so I did law. Your mother put the legacy on your shoulders of saying, oh, gee, I'd always wanted a boy. That's right, yes, that was right, <laughs> yes. Did you mean that seriously? Um, I think so, yes, yes. I wonder whether with only children need to play both boy and girl. I think so. I think probably when I think, you know, who had the greater effect on me, on the one hand it was my father, but on the other hand it was my mother. So I think her, her um, values made me want to do the things that boys do and wanted to um, succeed in the way that, you know, boys were expected to succeed, that is, through a profession. Or mm. Now you met Frank who uh, was to be here tonight, but... Uh, Has had a couple of teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he sensibly is staying home. Mm. Um, and had three daughters. No, two daughters and a son. Sorry, two yes. daughters and a son. Yes. Um, and but that also, the arrival of the children was a pivotal event in terms of your choice of what you could do as far as work was concerned. That's right. At that time in the law... Uh, part-time work was absolutely unheard of and um, um, I had a friend, in fact she's in the audience tonight, who found me a, a, a job one day a week and um, but it was a job that was so boring it was better to stay home than do it and so after a year I left and I thought about how I could stay in the um, in touch with the prof my profession so that when the children were older I could go back and I decided that the way of doing it was to start an employment agency for lawyers, which didn't exist at that time. And this was first-hand experience in terms of the differences, the gender differences between the treatment of men and women? No, not really. Um, it started as, uh, in the sense that it started as an employment agency for lawyers who wanted to work part-time, like me, and I thought they would be w women, right? But within a very short time, it became clear that there was a a niche in the market for all lawyers, and um, so I expanded the business well, very go, quickly. I was, in saying that, I was going, I was referring really to the difficulty of you getting work, 
with young children. Yes, that was... A so did you see that yes. through the lens of, uh, you know, the difficulties that women in particular faced? Yes, absolutely. Versus yes. circumstances men faced? Yes, yes. You'd been practising family law? Yes. Which... Um, uh, also affected me. Yes, well, explain yeah. that. Well, at that time, um, uh, women were involved mainly in unpaid work and I just found in a, an unhappy or an abusive marriage, the women just didn't have any money to leave the home with or without their children. And at that time, everything, um, even if a woman saved money from her housekeeping, it was, uh, the law said it belonged to her husband. And um, it was very, very hard to get a divorce. It was before no-fault divorce. And um, it just, uh, the, the field wasn't level. So for a time you actually, as well as practising family law, you worked for the Crown Solicitor in New South Wales? I worked for the Public Solicitor in yes. New South Wales, yes. On, on what sort of briefs? Anything. But it was mainly for people who couldn't afford a solicitor, a public solicitor. Right, so that further, I presume, gave you insights into what you're talking about in terms of gender differences? No, not there. Not so much there. Um, come come the, the introduction of the Family Law Act in 1975, mm -hmm. you had a particular involvement in that, didn't mm -hmm. you? Just explain mm -hmm. that. Well, I was um, a member of the Women's Electoral Lobby and we supported the bill, which was for no-fault divorce, and I and some other lawyers had um, meetings with Lionel Murphy, who was the Attorney General at the time, advocating for certain things in the legislation. What, what particularly concerned you? Um, about the role of a wife um, and um, property issues and such. Were they dealt with in the way that you were yeah, concerned? pretty much so, yes. So we were happy with the act when it came out. So what about the, uh, without going too far down, the family law tension, mm. what, what about the subsequent operation of the Family Law Act? How have you seen that? Well, I think it was an improvement to the, the, um, the old act, but I think over time there are about six um, lone fathers lobby groups who I think are, are you know, edging out some of the the level playing field issues. I think the, the, the real thing about the Family Law Act is that each party bears their own costs. And again, women are time poor and they're money poor. And in mo this is generalisations, of course. In most cases, they're time poor because they have the children with them and they mm. usually now have a part-time job. And they often agree to... Um, they often... Uh, agree to arrangements that are really not in the long-term interest of the children or even themselves. Well, the evidence has been, particularly over recent years, it's been accumulating that actually women financially, mm -hmm. sometime after a divorce, are much worse off than yes. their former husbands. Yes, that's the evidence. Did you foresee that happening? No, I don't think I directed my attention to it, but I'm not at all surprised. Mm. Again, for the reasons that I pointed out. So, in the absence of finding fulfilling work with three young children, you start the down the business track, and, and just explain the MyLab group, what you set up there. Well, the first thing I, I did was set up this working from home. I set up this employment agency for lawyers. That was virtually what it was, um, and um, I used to interview clients at home <laughs> until. My dog bit one of my clients, <laughs> then, then I decided to move into offices and my husband was very supportive all this time and so we found an office in St Kilda Road. What sort of dog? Hmm? It was a poodle. Uh, they're lovable but snappy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Anyway, so then I, I started this office and it was a really good business and then um, we expanded it to architects and um, that thrived too. And then I opened an office in Sydney and that went well too. But in 1973, I think it was. Therese Rain picked up on this idea in the, in the <laughs> few decades later. 
<laughs> I think she might have done it a bit better than I, I did. Anyway, in 1973, there was a recession and no one wanted to use. By that time, I called myself a consultant, actually. I wasn't an agency anymore. Anyway, by that time, um, at that time, nobody wanted to pay uh, the fees of a, an agency or a consultancy. So I started looking for uh, businesses that were recession proof. And I decided that I would publish a directory and diary for lawyers. Um, and um, that was in New South Wales because there already was one in Victoria. And also um, that I would start a costing business. Costing is something archaic that lawyers do and I won't go into the details here. But it was done by clerks. And I knew that there were many, many women lawyers in their homes looking after children who would do this work much better than clerks. And I knew that if I uh, developed this business using those women and enabling them to work at home but come into the office just once a week for coffee and meeting and discussions, um, that I would be competitive in the market. And I did that. And that grew into a business where I think at one time we were employing 30 women lawyers, all working from home, and one man who also worked from home. He liked to go fishing. And, um, and the directory, the diary and directory, had a 98% penetration of the New South Wales market. And the, after the recession, the recruitment business also uh, prospered, particularly as we started targeting the larger law firms and the newly developing legal departments of corporations. You must and that's been, been a growing business. You must have been ultra busy during this period. Yeah, I probably was, mm. yes. My children would say I was too busy. Did you, did you find that business involvement satisfying? Very, yes. But it wasn't nearly as satisfying as my involvement in the women's movement. And were you able to run those things par in parallel? Yes. So what particularly satisfied you about the women's movement? I don't know. It just had meaning for me. I felt it was a cause bigger my than myself. So at that time, um, we're really talking here about the 70s, 80s. Early 70s, right through the 70s. Um, what, uh, what were the key things that you were concerned about in terms of the women's movement? Mainly um, the relative powerless and invisibility of women. My major thing was to open the gates so that women could move out of uh, unpaid work into paid work and better paid work. So by the late 80s, was it around 89 you decided to sell the businesses? That's right. What uh, led you to that idea? It was a good time to sell a business and I had an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> And uh, Karen, your daughter, also, can you explain to us how she became involved in Well, the um, uh, there was one particular product um, that wasn't particularly profitable. Again, it was more a, a social service, really. It was a directory of not-for-profit um, organisations. And she took that... Called Pro Bono Australia. It was called Pro Bono. Right. Just the, it was just the directory. And she took that and used it as the seed of a social purpose business that provides resources to the not-for-profit sector. She has a newsletter now that I think reaches something like 17,000 readers. Um, she has other services, there's a, a website um, that matches um, uh, accountants and lawyers who are her market in some of her other publications with um, uh, volunteer opportunities in the not-for-profit area. Um, and she has other services. So the model for this, this uh, organisation went from really being supported, partly by you, uh, to being uh, now pay for service in part, is that right? I'm sorry, which what, which? So Pro Bono Australia or Pro yes, Bono as it was yes, called. Yes, yes. Um, uh, initially was supported by you when it was in my business. Yeah. Yes, but she 
bought it out of the business and did something. With and it. although it remains a not-for-profit, nevertheless it charges for some of its services. Yes, it does. Yes. So, which creates a viable model. Yes, it's in a, terms one of, of the new models of the social purpose venture. That's right. So, how does that work then? Just you might take us through that. Um, I think you'd have to ask Karen. I think um, it works in the sense that um, uh, I think her newsletter is is um, uh, free, um, but she carries some advertising in it, and um, I think there's some of her services that she charges for, and in return gives a lot of free services to the marketplace. Now, um, so a new stage of your life... Um, oh, and she takes the salary, of course. Right. new stage of your life starts with the sale of the businesses, and you take on various non-executive director roles. That's right. Across a range of things. You become the first woman to be appointed to the Westpac board. That's right. Just about the oldest company in Australia. That's right. And here we are appointing its first woman director. That's right. But you must understand that they'd gone through a very difficult time. They'd nearly gone broke. <laughs> you, so they were, they they were willing, they were willing to try new things. <laughs> radical ideas. That's right, radical ideas like employing a woman. <laughs> how, did you, how did you find, and I want to talk about the other board roles that you've had, because yes. you've been in many things, Film Australia, uh, yeah. the Walter Eliza Hall Institute, so mm -hmm. so philanthropic organisations, mm -hmm. research organisations and the like. How did you find the general atmosphere of boards Let's talk about commercial boards um, when you became a member. Excuse me. Well, it's different, or they're different, but if you want to talk about Westpac, which was the most commercial board, it, um, it was a very formal board, and um, I found it quite difficult. I found it quite alienating. You, you joined it after Kerry Packer momentarily. Was That's right. They'd just gone. That. Bob Joss had been appointed, and he brought American ideas. And um, uh, I, th I was a Melbourne person, and most of the board members were Sydney people. And it was fairly fairly formal in the sense that um, uh, you know some boards have. Um, uh, dinners the night before where directors can talk to each other and, and brainstorm or test ideas and Westpac didn't do that, at least not until the very end of my tenure. But quite frankly, um, so I thought the board, my experience on the board was quite intimidating and, and difficult. But on the other hand, most work in corporations is done on committees by directors, not on the board. And so I was on the Credit and Risk Committee and I found that very interesting. Minor the, the <coughs> women remain a very distinct minority on commercial boards, of course. Yes. Um, and there's a select group of women who tend to be on, like, like the men that are on boards, on, on uh, many boards. Um, also, there's been an increasing focus on the governance of organisations and the actual fiduciary duties of people on boards. So how well equipped, uh, what's, your, what's your observation about how well equipped boards are to actually handle the commercial uh, circumstances of the firm? I don't think you can make a generalisation about that at all. There's too much difference between boards and... Um, well, are, are we well served? I don't know. From the boards that you've had experience of, I mean, for example, were you were you regarded as were you seen as a token woman? Mm, no, I don't think I was seen as a token woman, um, but I I think that's different from the effectiveness of boards, and I can't really tell you. I think some boards are effective and others aren't, and um, there are so many variables. It's really hard to say. I know you've made the observation that um, on boards, anything approaching advocacy mm. is regarded as off the agenda. It's very actually, it's very difficult to get ideas up and running. Yes, um, and that was particularly so in my case because again, I tended to advocate for women and particularly women who were the majority of employees and women who were the majority of customers. And that was partially successful, 
But, you know, after a while I think the other board members used to turn off. You've said uh, that your experience was pretty lonely. Hmm, that's true. What, what do you mean? Well, I think that... Um, I think there is a sort of club or a network of, of, of men who are directors of boards. And I think um, women on the whole are not part of that club. Well, you're still uh, very active in um, advocacy for women. Yes. Tell us about the Women Donors Network. Right. Well, the Women Donors Network is a a community of women and men who promote philanthropic investment in women and girls. And uh, there are several reasons for this. We only have American figures, but the figures are that about 7% of foundation grants go to women and girls. Right Now, most foundation grants are what you'd call mainstream. They're ungendered. They're for the homeless or for asylum seekers or for sport or a general sort of purpose. And there is some evidence that um, uh, when it is assumed that men and women or boys and girls are the same, the philanthropy is not as effective uh, as it should be. And what we advocate is that grant makers, foundations, should be asking questions about whether an application for funding for a project, is the project targeted to reach uh, boys as well as girls or men and women? And if so, is it the design of the project taken into account that their circumstances may be different? The former president of the Kellogg Foundation in the United States has recently said, if you want to treat men and women equally, you have to understand that they are different. And um, I had a discussion just before we came together tonight about bullying. And um, the, one of the foundations um, represented here tonight is um, funding research into bullying. And I asked whether the situation for bullying is different between boys and girls. And it is. And so to make that project effective, those sorts of questions have got to be asked. The idea for this was based on a, a, an organisation called Mama Cash, is that right? Mama Cash is a Dutch foundation which um, funds women and girls, but they do mainly global funding and they believe they can change the world because they say that funding women and girls is more effective, that if you fund a woman, there is a flow-on effect to a family and a community. And less so with men? Um, yes, less so. There's evidence to that. What's the flow-on effect then? The flow-on effect, well, one flow-on effect mm -hmm. is that if you fund a woman, she, um, a lot of funding, for instance, microcredit is a good mm -hmm. example, which is mainly funds, it's not intended directly for women, but in fact 98% of people who take it up. And a woman builds a home and educates her children and shares her knowledge with other people, whereas the evidence is, and this is mainly in developing countries, um, that men tend to uh, spend money on themselves. No doubt there are, there are exceptions, uh, but this is a general uh, arrangement. How have you been able to generate energy then around the Women's Donors Network? Just by having various functions. We've had a couple of functions in Melbourne, another couple in Sydney, where we got very, very good crowds. We've also um, been the catalyst for Philanthropy Australia, which is the, um, uh, the umbrella organisation for the philanthropic sector, has published an edition of their magazine on funding of women and girls. Uh, we've had publicity in, in the paper. And there is even, and we're part of a global movement of, um, called the Women's Funding Network, which brings together women's funds. And there is evidence very interestingly, over the last year since the financial crisis hit, that whereas most funding has gone down, the funding of women and girls has gone up. And there's some evidence that that's the case in Australia as well. There are, you have tool, a toolkit, really, that goes with We're publishing system. a toolkit which asks the questions that I mentioned before. For, for grant makers or foundations, when 
they have an application for funding to ask, is this project, it's a process they go through, to ask, is this um, a project designed to reach women and men equally? Um, uh, does it target women and men equally? And if so, is it designed and has the design taken into account that women's circumstances and men's circumstances may be different? Different. Homeless is a good example again. Women who are homeless often have dependent children and can't go to many of the accommodation places that men go to because they're just not safe. Is this starting to make a difference, do you feel? I feel that there is. There is some evidence that the funding of, um, of women's funds is going up. Eve, it's been great talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Peter.